Yeah, so here we will be talking about combinatorial optimization problems and we will be discussing about D-Wave and IBM Q for a while and then we will see how we are able to solve the combinatorial optimization problems using D-Wave which is the annealing model which uses the quantum annealing process for solving the problems and then we will see how we solve these problems on the gate model which can be done through the IBM Q, which is the universal quantum computing model from IBM. So as our company Blue Cat is, a net, is in both networks, it's in the D-Wave networks and it's also in the IBM Q networks. So we have access to the D-Wave quantum computer and we also have the access to the latest IBM Q quantum computer. So First, we're looking into D-Wave and IBM Q in a short, and then we'll go ahead with the solving the combinatorial, combinatorial optimization problems. So the D-Wave computer here. <coughs> so we have D-Wave Leap, which is a software stack, and here you can see both the hardware and the software stack. So D-Wave Leap here is a cloud-based quantum application environment, which provides us access to the D-Wave quantum computer which is this D-Wave 2000Q. So actually the people, they use this cloud uh, leap, D-Wave leap or this cloud-based service for able to work on the problems, the combinatorial problems. And yeah, so we'll look into the hardware part of this quantum computer, the D-Wave 2000Q first. So, this is the D-Wave system, the quantum computing system, which is in Canada and Vancouver. And we have access to this system as we are a network. We are in the part of the network of D-Wave as we have done projects with the D-Wave company and we are part with them. So this is a big box. You can see it is 10 feet by 10 feet by 10 feet. It's like big enough as a room. And in this box, we have what we say, the quantum processing unit or the main quantum computer, which it's used for working on the annealing problems. So yeah, here we see these cylinders, the hanging cylinders. We have these hanging cylinders inside the D-Wave big box. And these cylinders, this one cylinder contain the cryostate or the cryogenic arm, which has the quantum processing unit or the processing chip, which works, which uses quantum annealing in solving these problems. So as we can see, this is a, thick cylinder with 16 layers between the quantum chip and the environment. So we are using this layers just so as to shield it from shield the quantum state from the environment. And so that there's less of a noise and the qubits or the operations and all the qubits and the gates, they don't reach a state of decoherence and all and they don't lose the quantumness and we are not able to this protects the quantum chips from interacting with the environment actually. So inside this cylinder, we have this cryostate or the cryogenic arm, which you can see here. So starting from the top, we see there's the temperature keeps on decreasing, decreasing as we come from the top till the bottom. And the bottom of this arm is the processor or the QP or the quantum processing unit, which, has, which actually has a chip for the quantum annealer algorithm. So here we can see the initially the temperature, initial temperature is 77 Kelvin, then it reduces to four Kelvin, then one Kelvin. And in the end, the QP or the processor is at a temperature of 0 0.015 Kelvin, which is very, very cold or even colder than the interstellar space. So we actually need this temperature so as to, we can say the controller qubits so they don't have the exciting, like they don't excite enough and they don't interact with each other and they are in a stable state. So we keep this processor, processor at this temperature. And similarly, we keep it in high vacuum, which is 10 billion times lower than the atmospheric pressure. Just for the same reason that it stays control, controlled and stable and we are able to work on the problem. And the D-Wave computer uses less than 25 kilowatt power, power, which is way, way less than the normal HPCs or the high performance computing systems or the supercomputers which use, which we use currently. <coughs> so as we see, this is a close-up of the processing chip. <coughs> 
So this is the main chip here, which has a grid like structure. And here you can see, I'll show you in the next slide that these are the grid like structures and these are 16 by 16 grids. And each grid has eight qubits. <laughs> like we saw that this, the DVA machine is called a D-Wave 2000 Q because it has 2048 qubits. So we can say an approach 2000 qubits. So here we can see we have 16 grids by 16 grids and each grid has eight qubits. So the total number of qubits will be 256 into eight, which comes out to be 2048. And this is the number of qubits in the quantum leader. So here we each this cell, each grid is known as a unit cell here. So if we magnify the unit cell, will this will look like this. And here we can see, as I told you, there were eight qubits in a unit cell. So here this tiny loop of wire is one qubit. So here one, two, three, four, these are the four qubits. And then again, these four qubits are there and they constitute the eight qubits in one unit cell. So normally in aligning, what we do is we try to control the weights of the qubits and the strengths of the interacting qubits or the coupling qubits. So here we can see a one qubit interacting with other qubit. This is called as junction. And these are the interacting parts of the annealing process and a single qubit is a linear part. So what we try to do is in annealer is we control the weights of these linear qubits and we try to control the strengths or the coupling strengths of the interacting qubits and that how we get to reach a solution. So, so this, the counter process unit has a chimera graph topology, which is this way that we can see that, like I told you, there were 16 by 16 grids or there were 16 by 16 unit cells and each unit cell had eight qubits. So we can see we have the eight qubits here and these are connected in this way. In a chimera topology way fashion where fourth qubit is connected to zero, third, first and second. And similarly, these qubits are connected in this way. So here we have four horizontal and four vertical qubits like we saw here, four vertical and the four horizontal qubits and the connection between the qubits are given this way. So as a whole total, they come out to be 2048 qubits. But you can see here that there are in these two qubits and somewhere here, some qubits are missing. This happens because when we are calibrating this processing unit, when we are calibrating this processor, sometimes we have to reduce the number of units or interchange the qubits so as to gain knowledge or so as to able to do it perfectly, the problem so as to able to work on the problems perfectly. So this all comes in the calibration stage that we have to do some of the qubits here so as to work properly. So as I told you this, the D-Wave uses quantum annealing as an algorithm or a computational method for solving the combinatorial optimization problems. So here we'll see that we can actually see landscape as a metaphor for the quantum annealing problem. So in an annealing problem, what we can say that we have a space of solutions which define an energy landscape where the best solution is the lowest value. So this is a solution space and this is the energy landscape which we see. And here, the deepest or the lowest valley or the lowest depth we can say is the solution which we desire for or is the solution, the minimum solution or the minimum energy of our uh, this energy landscape and classically what we can see is if we try to do it classically what the best, best possible option for us or choice for us is to walk over these landscapes. So if I want to go to the lowest or the deepest or the lowest valley, I'll have to climb this and then I have to go down, which could be a lower, lowest, what we can say a local minimum then again I have to climb and then I have to go down and this way we have to reach to the lowest state or a state which is close enough to the lowest state. So in classically we have to actually walk over this landscape which is done by the simulator learning in which we have the thermal fluctuations and all and we work 
here in this way that we climb and we go down, then we climb and go down, and we finally reach the global minimum. But what happens in quantum annealing is that we actually work with the quantum effects such as quantum tunneling or the tunneling fluctuations because of which we can actually go through the hills. So that's one advantage and this allows us to reach the global minimum or the local minimums or the minimum points in this landscape faster. And this is one of the property of the quantum effect quantum tunneling. You can go and read about quantum tunneling where there's a very less probability so how I can describe the quantum tunneling is like if we have a box and if I have a particle which is at the inside the box but at the edge of the edge of the box or at the corner of the box. So if we keep on measuring the particle, if we keep keep on seeing the position of the particle, there's a very less probability that we can even see that particle out of the box, out of the premises of the box. So generally what we see is the particle is inside the box most of the time, but with very less probability, we are able to get the particle out of the box, which is due to the quantum tunneling effect. <coughs> so yeah, so in quantum tunneling, what we do is we specify an objective function. And in order to formulate like we first for a combinatorial optimization problem, we have to formulate a problem. We have to have a structure for the problem so as to so that we can give that problem as input to the quantum annealer or the D wave. So our problem or objective function is this way where this is the energy graph and this is a complete solution space. And here the solutions are actually the variables and the energy values. These are the functions of the variables. So we have to reach a set of variables or a binary set of variables. These variables all are all binary zeros or ones. So we have to reach a solution, which is a string of zeros or ones of so string of these binary variables so that the energy level or the energy complete energy of the system is minimum. And we use quantum physics so as to find the lowest energy with the highest probability. <laughs> so what we actually do here is we run our algorithm or rerun the annealer, annealer a number of times, which is, num which is also called as the number of shots. And then we sample out the outputs here and then we try to gain the lowest energy. So every time, even in the gate model in the annealer, we have to run this process many number of times so as to get the best accurate or the lowest energy level with highest probability. And we can see the lower the energy level, the better the solution we get. So it's not always we're looking for a global minimum. We can always, we can also work with a local minimum, which is closer to global minimum, but we try to get the energy to the lowest. And if the energy is the lowest, then the solution is the best. Otherwise it's a good enough solution. <laughs> so, yeah. So we have two perspectives of quantum annealing. The first one comes from the physics where we have quantum Ham Hamiltonian, which is an operator on the Hilbert space. And the second comes, which is easier to understand for the mathematicians and the computer scientists, which is this optimization model, which is also called as the Cubo model, quantum unconstrained binomial optimization problem, where a and B are the coefficients where A is the coefficient for the single qubit. Like I told you before that we have to control the weights for the single qubits and the coupling strengths for the interacting qubits. So here is it's similar to that. We have a coefficient for the linear qubits and we have the coefficient for the interacting qubits or the coupling qubits. These are called the coupling strengths and these are called the bias. <laughs> and this is called the cubo formulation. And this is just for understanding that how the quantum annealing works and how is it originated. So normally in quantum mechanics, we have a Hamiltonian or the quantum Hamiltonian, which is, which gives us the energy, which tells us the energy of the system, total energy of the system. Exactly. So how we start in this is we originate this, the quantum annealing and the, both the gate models 
in the gate model we call it qaoa which is a quantum approximate optimization algorithm and in the annealing part this annealing model we have the quantum annealing so both of these have their origin for the from the adiabatic quantum computing so in the adiabatic quantum computing what we have is uh, wait let me open a slide for that <coughs> yeah so here we can see in the adiabatic quantum computing what we have we have the total hamiltonian here which gives us the energy of the system and it can be written as a function of the in initial hamiltonian and the objective hamiltonian which is the final hamiltonian <laughs> similarly we can see here this is this corresponds to this physical quantity st and bs correspond to the physical quantity 1 minus st and here in the d wave or the quantum annealer what we use we use the initial hamiltonian as this which is the sum of the poly x operators and the final hamiltonian is the icing hamiltonian or the objective hamiltonian which whose ground state or the lowest ground state or the lowest eigen value which you want to find so when we are trying to learn about or getting to know about the origin of this quantum manning we try to go to the adiabatic quantum computing where we see that the hamiltonian as a function of time is written as this and here this is the initial hamiltonian this being the final or the objective hamiltonian and what we trying to do here is we start from the initial hamiltonian whose ground state is easy to easy to be found so these hamiltonians are just hermitian matrices if you go into the matrix or the matrices theory and uh, if you want to know how these hamiltonians are made these hamiltonians are just a sum of the hermitian matrices and the ground state of this matrix or the ground state of this hamiltonian is the most stable state that's what quantum mechanics say that if you are able to gain the ground state of a hamiltonian or if you are able to gain the ground state of an operator that's the best state which we can gain and that's the best state which we can work on so actually we start in this process we start from the ground state of an initial hamiltonian the initial hamiltonian being hi and we go slowly very very slowly because okay let's see this so here this is the complete hamiltonian graph you can see these are the eigen values and this is the these are the eigen states and these being the eigen values for the states so here at time 0 we start with the initial hamiltonian which is the hi and then we keep on going here this being one initially so this becomes zero so we start with an hi and this an alternative of this which we can see in the d wave is here we are starting this one and this as zero so like i said initially with we start with one like we are starting with a ground state of a initial hamiltonian which is easy to find so we actually starting with the coefficients of the linear terms so here the coefficient of linear terms being high and the coefficient of the interacting terms or the coupling terms being low so here we start with as being as high and 1 and bs being 0 so initially we have this state and then we control these values this happens due to the magnetic field and all we a magnetic field is being sent through the quantum annealer and this changes the values of as and bs or the values for the single qubits and the coupling qubits and slowly slowly this keeps on reducing and this keeps on increasing in a controlled manner and how are we able to achieve that control way is by being in the ground state of the hamiltonian and how are we able to be in the ground state of the hamiltonian by taking this process really really slow i'll tell you how this happens here we start from the initial hamiltonian and if i am taking this process really fast then what one of them is happening that can happen is that this ground state energy is like let's say the particle starts from here it's in the ground state of the initial hamiltonian if we take it very fast what can happen that it can by chance reach the excited state 
not being in the ground state it can reach the excited state of the hamiltonian and which is not what we want we want to be in the ground state we want to be in the stable state we want to get the correct answer so we have to be in the ground state so we take it really really slow so that when we reach this minimum spectral uh, gap so actually we denote rho we denote the gap between the ground state and the excited state by rho so when we reach this place where the minimum ground state here and the uh, excited state here and the gap between them gets really minimum we call that as minimum spectral gap and which is given by rho m and tau as being the time taken for the annealing process the time taken for the adiabatic process we can see that if the gap between these two gets really really low then the time taken for the whole process gets really really large and that just because of that we have to contain the process we have to take this process in a very slow manner and as in the normal in the nature and in the normal chemical operations and in chemistry in the molecular operations and all what we are trying to achieve is the hamiltonians or the these operators tend to be very complex and as those tend to be really complex this minimum spectral gap gets really really low so if we tend to see practical situations in the practical situations this gap is very low always so we have to take this process in a slow manner and once we overtake this this part of the minimum spectral gap then we can get faster but here just because of this this being very close we have to take very very slow here here this place we can take it again take it fast so as to reach the final hamiltonian so this way initially we start with st being one and v being this being the initial hamiltonian and we being in the ground state of the initial hamiltonian then we reduce st it starts from one it starts from one and then it becomes zero so finally we reach the objective hamiltonian which we are trying to achieve so this is the prerequisite or the origin of quantum annealing and the qa algorithm which are basically used for solving the combinatorial optimization problems so here again we see this being the physical properties physical quantities this being the initial hamiltonian and normally in the quantum annealing and in the qa we take the initial hamiltonian to be the sum of all the sigma axes and we take the final hamiltonian to be this which is this objective function which we are dealing with so normally what in d wave and all and when we are trying to formulate a problem we just work with this we are not concerned about this because d wave takes care of this by itself and this is the objective function which we have to deal with so here we see this qi and qi qj these are binary variables qi being 0 and qi and qj being 1 uh q0 1 being binary variables so this comes out to be a uh, cubo formulation which is in terms of binary variables 0 or 1 we and another formulation which is used in this is the icing formulation uh here we will see the icing formulation so like we saw before this is a few more for cubo formulation with q and qb with the binary variables and normally for the gate model we deal with the icing formulation and in the quantum annealing we can work with both cubo and icing so how we are able to get an icing formulation so normally icing formulation is used in ferromagnetism where we have a chain of spins which can be plus 1 or minus 1 and why we actually use an icing formulation for this objective function in quantum computing we can say this as when we are trying to convert this 
so there is an easy formula for us to convert a cubo formulation into an ic formulation is that if this is zero and we want to convert this to plus 1 or minus 1 what we do is we write this q is equal to 2 sigma uh, sorry the sigma is equal to 2 q minus 1 Where q is this variable, the binary variable, and sigma here is the icing variable, which we can say. So the icing values are plus one, minus one. The binary variables here are zero and minus one. So if we write this as that way, that two q minus one. If q is zero, we get sigma is equal to zero minus one, which is minus one. So we get the icing value minus one, uh, which you can see here. And if this q is one, then we get sigma is two minus one, which is one, which becomes plus one. So why are we using this icing formulation for the objective function? Because in quantum computing, quantum mechanics, we have the variables, we have the operators, uh, the Pauli operators, in the form which are sigmas. And as we are using sigma z operators for objective function because this is the reason for this is because our computers our quantum computers are built so as to able to measure in the computational basis and the computational basis are the sigma z basis so we try to write our objective function in the form of sigma z's and why we are writing sigma so like i told you why we are using sigmas instead of the plus one minus one icing values because the sigma z operator or the sigma z matrix tends to have expectation value or tends to have the eigen values plus 1 and minus 1 for the zeroth quantum state and one quantum state so if we have the computational basis 0 and 1 which can be uh, spin half plus half minus half we can say that us when we measure it when we measure the sigma z basis when we measure the sigma z operator corresponding to any state, we get a plus one value for a zero state and we get a minus one value for the plus for the one state. So we tend to use the icing formulation for this. And annealing, we use both the cubo and the icing formulations. <clears throat> so yeah. So next we start with a problem. <laughs> so let's say we want we have two qubits and we want to make an objective function we want to make an energy function for which both the qubits are same so for this to happen what this can be a total table which we can make for these two to be the same and for our quantum annealing process or our, or our annealer to give us a solution where both these qubits are the same we have to have the least energy or energy being zero when these two are same so if we have qubit zero and one and the energy here this being the objective function here we can say if these both are zeros so putting q1 as zero and q2 as zero and q1 q2 here as zero this whole comes out to be zero so our energy is coming out to be zero here it being zero and one will define the a1 a2 and b1 b2 this will be defined so as to get these values so for us to get minimum value for q1 q2 being the same zero zero or one one how we define this is we give a1 as one a2 as one and b2 b12 as minus 2 so when these two are 0 0 this whole comes out to be 0 thus giving the lowest energy when q1 is 0 this becomes 0 q2 is 0 q2 is 1 this becomes 1 into 1 as we have defined a2 and a1 as 1 this is 1 and this comes out to be 0 as a product of 0 and 1 so here the energy comes out to be 1 here in this the q1 being 1 and q2 being 0 again the same thing energy comes out to be 1 
and as you have defined a1 as 1 a2 as 1 and b12 as minus 2 we'll see this case here if we put q1 as 1 and q2 as 1 and here it being 1 so we'll get 1 plus 1 minus 2 which is again 0 so this way we can actually formulate our objective function or we can write the cubo formulation for our objective function which is given to the d wave computer which is given to the annealer to solve and for us to get the minimum value for this or the minimum energy for this answer being a string of q q1 and q2 and the energy being the minimum energy of this objective function so this is one way of writing the objective function so how the d wave acts is we establish a sampler sampler is sampler can be any the we have two kind of samplers here the hybrid classical quantum solver and the d wave qpu which is the quantum computer proper quantum computing unit for the d wave we have to choose if we want to use the hybrid quantum classical solver or if you want to use the qpu or the processing unit of d wave the quantum computer then we define our objective function and we define the h and the j's h and j's being this the h is the linear term for the coefficient for the linear term and j being the coupling term here the coefficient for the coupling term here then we send this information to the sampler whatever sampler we have defined or chosen and then we evaluate the response so response gives us the minimum energy and it also gives us the solution for which the solution of the many variables for which we are getting the minimum energy <laughs> so yeah <laughs> so actually this there this is a research paper i'll give the link of the research paper here this is a research paper which actually has a cubo formulation for many we can say most of the np hard problems so as you would be you would be knowing about the np hard problems the np hard problems are very difficult to be solved classically they the np hard problems can't be solved polynomial by the classical turing machine and it can be verified polynomial polynomially but they can't be solved polynomially by the classical or the conventional computers and this if we try to write a cubo formulation for those np hard problems if those np hard problems in a cubo formulation if we write those cubo formulation we are able to design a problem for the quantum computer for us to work on the np hard problems and for us to check if we can polynomially solve those np hard problems till now there hasn't been much results much good results where we are able to solve a big enough npr problem let's say a traffic routing problem or a traveling salesman problem any problem in good enough amount of time but we are gradually growing there and we are defining a way we are improving our tools we are improving our algorithms for us to be able to work on those problems in the near future so yeah so like i told you we have this cubo formulations for most of the npr problems so the basic cubo formulation is this where we have a matrix which is defined by q we have x as a column vector and xt being the transpose of this column vector being the row vector so the similar way like i told you here this can be written in this way or uh, this formulation where if q is a matrix as we know that these q's here are zeros and one so if we have a matrix here which has the coefficients this matrix q having the coefficients here ai and the bij's so ai here is are the dynamic elements or we can say as aii so ii 
zero zero one one two two three three. If a matrix is three by three matrix, then zero zero one one two two. These three elements are the elements. B I J elements are the off diagonal uh, diagonal elements. Let me see. Maybe they must. Have, yeah. <laughs> so here we can see this being the cube formulation where x1 square and x2 square x3 square x4 square these can be written as qi or xi because as these are binary terms 0 and 1 the square of the 0 and 1 comes out to be 0 or 1 so when we are trying to have a big enough cube formulation and in the cube formulation let's say here uh we'll see some q formulation yeah because when we are trying to minimize the function we try to square this we try to get the minimum of the square norm here and then we have these square terms which becomes actually becomes x1 because x1 square is similar to x1 x2 square is same as x2 x3 square becomes same as x3 x4 square becomes same as x4 so here this being the cube formulation with these are the linear terms and these are the quadratic terms like we saw we can create a matrix for this for these coefficients like this where the diagonal elements are the linear elements here and the off diagonal elements x1 x2 what how we can there is a way we can write that we just have a upper triangular matrix so here we see this being two this being two The total is four x one x two. We can even write this as four and this as zero. If we make the lower triangle of the matrix as zero, then we'll have these as a twice or the sum of these two. So this will become eight four plus four. This will remain zero. This will become one plus one, so this will become two. And we can keep the lower triangle as zero. But if we want to divide this, or we can write it this way. we can write it two here two here eight being here four here four here and this way this being the equation for the cube formulation and we can write in this way so here we see some of the npr problems like number partitioning problem then like yeah the matrix will come out to be big so here if you are trying to partition if you are considering a set of eight numbers the matrix becomes 8 by 8 and we have to either include a number or not include a number so we have to give a value of 0 or 1 to a number if you are including the number we give the value of 1 for the x variable and if you want to give you not include the number we give it a value of 0 for the x variable and this comes out to be the matrix this is objective function for the number partition problem then there is a max cut problem which we'll be discussing which is one of the what we say an important or a problem to be talked about and we'll be discussing this problem and we'll seeing how we'll see how d wave works on this problem so matrix problem this the cube formulation comes out to be this then we yeah then again so these are the problems which don't do not have any penalties or do not have any constraints here we just have to minimize an objective function we get an objective function we min we minimize this objective function we get the value of this string for x which is the correct answer and this this complete thing is to be minimized sometimes what we have is we have constraints and we have which we can say as penalties which can write them as penalties so let's say we have a cube problem we have an objective function we have a where we have a constraint where x plus y is less than equal to 1 so here x y these two are the two binary variables x1 and x2 we can write this as x1 x2 here uh like here q1 and q2 qy this qy is this so it is q1 q2 q3 or x1 x2 whatever you can so let's say we have a classical constraint in an np hard problem which we have to uh, a problem objective function which we have to minimize with 
these are the constraints what we try to do is we add a penalty you can work out this that how this helps as a penalty for this constraint how this helps as a penalty for this constraint you can work out this so we write a penalty with the objective function and uh, here we can see yeah so this being the objective function which is fx we add a penalty with p x1 x2 here for this constraints if the constraint is x plus y greater than equal to 1 then we'll add the penalty p of 1 minus x1 minus x2 plus x1 x2 and then we try to minimize the whole objective function which we are getting and here p should be large enough value large enough value this is the same you can use this as same like in machine learning we try to do regular regularization so in regularization we try to add a sigma and for us to able to minimize the function the same way as we're doing in regularization in the machine learning we are trying to add a penalty here with p as a coefficient here which is a big enough value so yeah so we have a, this minimum vertex curve problem which is np hard problem we have to minimize this this being our objective function with this as a constraint so this becomes our new cube formulation new objective function and we try to minimize this so here we have done this so this is a new objective function this being our initial objective function and this being the constraints added or the penalty added penalties added so we minimize the whole thing this is a matrix that comes out as q or the coefficients and then we get a solution for these binary variables x as 0 1 1 0 1 which is for this graph uh, wait a minute i'll be back just one minute Yeah. So this way you can consult to this research paper for all these icing and the cube formulation. So many, many problems and BR problems. And this is a good research for this uh, good material to be consulted. So yeah, uh, we saw that how D wave works and how we establish an sampler, define an objective function send the information to the quantum processing unit as a sampler and then we validate the response. So here we'll see at one of the problems and how do you solve this? We'll see at this maximum cut problem. The maximum cut problem being we have a graph. Uh, let's see, we have it here. Hmm. Uh, partitioning. Yeah. This is a max curve problem. So we have this graph, let's say, and we want to divide this into two sets so that the number of edges or the cut, which we say are maximum between the two sets. So let's say if we divide this graph as one and two in one set and three, five and four in the other set, then the number of edges between these sets are just two. This and this so we have to maximize the number of edges between these two sets so like yeah we have to divide our graph into two sets such that the number of edges between those sets are maximum so for example here if the solution i can tell you the solution here being two three being in one graph and one four five being in the other set so this being one set two and three and one four five being the other set so here we can see that then the number of edges between these two sets becomes out to be five it comes out to be three as this is one set and this 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 being other set so this is one edge between this these two sets this being other edge and this being the third edge and this way we can see that there are three edges 
which is a solution for this. So the number maximum number edges which we can get. So, yeah. For us to write the cubo formulation for this, what we do? We try to write this function, which is our objective function, where x0 and xv, xu and xv are the binaries, binary variables. This being the result or the answer for the objective function, which we have to minimize, or the minimization problem, which we say. So the function for one edge. So how we deal with this problem is, let's say if we are on the edge, on the what is zero of this one, if this is in one set, two and three are in the other sets, what we try to do is we denote this vertex by one and we denote these vertices which are one set by zero so that we can get a string of zeros and one as a result for these vertices and the strings of one will be the vertices which are in one set and the strings of the number of zeros in those or the strings of zeros in that will be the vertices of the other set. So here we can see that let's say one is in one is zero and three is one. These two are different sets. One is in one set and three is in another set. So what we'll say is this edge comes out to be one as we have to maximize the number of edges. So if there is an edge between two different sets that comes out to be one, the edge comes out to be one. This is one. If there is an edge between two points in the same set that comes out to be zero. So that we are able to maximize these edges, which are in different sets. And if we sum, it, uh, sum over all these edges, then we'll get the maximum number of edges, which are between the, both the sets. So let's see here how we have defined this for a single edge. This is for a single edge where this is one vertex of that edge, of that edge and this is another vertex of that edge. So how we define is if both the vertices are in the same set, if both the vertices are the same set, then both the vertices will be written as zeros or ones. And if they're in the same set, then this objective function here or the, this function here gives a value zero. And we'll see there's a confusing thing here because we have to minimize this function, but we are seeing that we are getting the zero answer for zero zero, which is not the right answer. I'll tell you later on how this is going to be. So we have to maximize. This is not a minimization function. Actually, this is a maximization function because we have to maximize the number of edges here. The number of edges between both the sets we have to maximize. So if we are having a function for this objective function for this problem, this graph, then we have to maximize this objective function. But how the D wave and the gate model and the QA works that we, those work for minimization problems. So one easy way for us to change a minimization problem into a maximization problem is just by multiplying the whole objective function by minus negative. So if we take a negative of the whole, then we just have to minimize it. Then it can be a good enough input for the D wave and for the QA algorithm. And we can just minimize that. And finally, we can get an answer by doing negative of the answer objective of this, which we are getting. So what we do in this case is first we have to maximize this function. So for maximizing this function, this is one edge. This is the function between one. Uh, this is a function of one edge or between two vertices. So here, this being in the same set, this comes out zero. This being the different set, this comes out to be one. This these being the different sets, this come out, comes out to be one. These being the same set, this comes out to be zero. So this is the function x u plus x v minus two x u x v, which gives us these values. And as we have to maximize this and our D wave and our annealer works in minimizing this, we'll just put a negative sign in front of this and we'll minimize that problem and we'll get the maximum result. Yeah. So we'll actually see. Uh, yeah. 
so we'll see in d wave so yeah first i'll show you the d wave dashboard this is the dashboard for d wave so yeah if you log in on to the d wave leaf which is the cloud platform which is an application environment for us to gain the access to the quantum processing unit or the quantum computer of the d wave this is a leap the web leap is a platform so here you can register on this you this is i guess free trial they are giving us for a limited amount of time and you can make use of the qpu or the quantum computer of d wave for one minute so i have used like a few of bit of second for my problems so this comes out to one minute you can use this this being the qpu and you can use the other sampler which is the hybrid sampler for i guess any number of time so here you will be using the qpu for the maximum cut problem so we'll go into the workspaces <laughs> so yeah start we'll go into one to one of the examples which we have given to solve this problem there are many problems which are there on dev as an example so the environment is loading here yeah <coughs> so here if you'll we'll see this is the problem the max cut problem this is the id or you can use this id and you can work on this id this is provided by dwave and it's you have a free trial for this so this being the problem like the graph i showed you so if these three are let's see this problem if these three are in one set and this is in another another set so the number of edges in between these two sets is 3 the cut comes out to be 3 if this is in one set and these two are in the other set the cut comes out to be 3 again here if these three are in one set and these two are in the other set then the cut comes out to be 2 which is not the solution we are looking for <laughs> so yeah this again being like i showed you before this being the truth table for the edges we have to maximize this function which is for one edge we have to sum it over all the edges these being the sum of all the edges this being for the one of the edge and as dwe when it works in a minimization fashion then we'll do a negative of this objective function and we'll try to minimize that so as to get a minimum the minimum most minimum value and then we'll do a negative of the minimum value and we'll we'll get the maximum number of edges and we'll also get the output or the vertices which belongs to both sets so this comes out to be the graph or this comes out to be the sorry matrix for the q matrix like i told you the cube formulation there is a matrix in that and we actually provide a matrix this matrix in the form of dictionary to d wave so that it can work on this problem so here we see as this being the solution this being the problem we can write this here in the form of this matrix where if we we'll, you can see that if if we have this graph and you can write for this graph uh, we'll see here we have the graph here yeah so the edges of the graph being 1 2 1 3 2 4 3 4 3 5 and 4 5 for those edges this q comes out to be the matrix and x these axes and these axes being the row and the column vectors which we have to multiply the trans x and the transpose x which multiply by this and we have to minimize that whole the objective function we also have an icing formulation where we can change this axes as plus 1 and minus 1 here the x here are 0 and 1 so you can do the transition like i told you transition from 0 1 to plus 1 minus 1 and you can get the icing formulation 
So here in D-Wave, first when bringing in the libraries, these being the libraries which we are using, the DO libraries, the sampler, uh, this is for the plotting the graph. This is the network X library, which is used for, which is used as a graph, which we use to make graphs. So here, initially we try to create an empty graph. We use a network, network X library, which creates a data, data structure on object of a graph. We fill this graph with these edges, one, two, one, three, which is corresponding to this graph. These are the edges. And similarly, we fill the graph with these edges. Mm, sorry, this is the icing one, sorry. Yeah, here, so this is the graph, we create an empty graph. And we fill the graph with these edges. We define an initial default dictionary. Like I told you that we represent this matrix in D-Wave in the form of a dictionary. So how we are doing this, the dictionary has the linear terms, which are the ii and the jj terms, and the quadratic terms ij. So here we see, here like we did minus one, minus one, and plus two. So for the binary terms, which we will write the coefficient as plus two, and for the linear terms, we are going to write the coefficient as minus one. So here we are filling this dictionary. So this dictionary for the tuple one, one for this. So for, for I and J and I, J and the G edges. So one, one, this comes out to be minus one. For two, two, it comes out to be minus one again. For three, three, it comes out to minus one. Four, four comes out to minus one. Five, five, it comes out to minus one. So this comes out to minus one and Again, we are doing it twice. One is coming twice, two is twice. So this way we are able to fill the matrix in this form. We are, these are the linear terms, minus terms, which we're getting. So corresponding to these and these of Daniel terms, again, we are the coefficients we are getting in the corresponding to these quadratic terms. So when we fill, when we write this whole, so here we have how many edges? One, two, three, four, five, six. So here we are having six edges. So we'll have these six terms. So when we expand this for all the six edges, we get this as a matrix. We try to put that matrix in a dictionary form for our D we have to work on. So this dictionary we are putting for every ii or one one we are adding a minus one for the linear terms and for the minus quadratic terms we are adding a plus two. So change strength here, change strength is nothing but it just tells us like, like I showed you the chimera topology or the chimera graph for the D wave and how the qubits are connected. Let me show you again. I'm talking about this. So this way the qubits are connected. So let's say we have, so here what this D wave does is it automatically embeds these logical qubits. The logical qubits being this, these X i's, these X i's being logical qubits, this it automatically embeds these onto the physical qubits, the physical qubits being these qubits. It does this work on its own. You have two ways. You can either manually embed these or you want D wave to automatically embed these. So here we are using this embedding composite function. So I so automatically embed these. And as we saw that this is our topology or the graph for the qubits in the QPU. So if one qubit is here and the other qubit comes out to be somewhere far away. So what we're trying to do is we try to create chains. So what we'll do is we'll split a qubit into five physical qubits. So we'll split a logical qubit. Let's say this is a logical qubit, a logical qubit. These are the logical qubits, five logical qubits. Let's, we can split this logical qubit X zero into five physical qubits with, and the sum of all those physical qubits, the coefficients are the sum of those, all the physical qubits. 
will be equivalent to the one logical qubit. So let's say we have one qubit here and one qubit far away. Then we have to create chains of qubits so as that this is able to interact between those qubits because otherwise, how are we able to do a coupling or interaction between this and this qubit? It's really difficult. So chain strength actually tells us this, that what is the strength of the chain which we can keep or the number of chains which we can create, the length of the chains which we can create for us to able to connect two qubits which are far away. Number of runs is the number of times you are running this or the number of shots like I told you. We have to run this on hundreds, thousands, maybe 10,000 times in bigger problems. And then we have to sample out of those to get the solution with the least energy, which has the highest probability. So next we go here. We use a sampler. So we use a sampler. We are embedding it, automatically embedding it. We're using the QPU sampler, which is the original quantum processing unit. We could also use the hybrid sampler here to solve the problem. Then here the response gives us the result for our annealing process. So here we have the sampler, we have sample cubo, cubo. Then in the parameters, we have this as a cubo formulation or the cubo function. This is objective function. This is, these are the parameters of chain strength and this is the parameter of number of times you have to run this process. So here, I'll, they have this. So first this energies gives us this variable gives us the energy for the solution and here below we'll run this problem. This is just for printing out the solutions and this is for getting the graph out of the solution. So we'll run the D wave. Yeah. So we saw that we ran this 10 number of times and we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven solutions we are getting, which are the different cut sizes and it is showing us by the reduced or the increasing energies, minimum energies of this. So like we saw, this creates one, four, five being in the first set and two, three being the other set. This has the lowest energy. This has the lowest energy for the eigenfunction and the cut size being the negative of this, which is five. And again, in the two, three, five set and one, four being the other set, it again comes out to be this as the lowest energy. This is another way which we can write where we have this as a lowest energy and this is these three correspond to the maximum cuts. These are the cuts which are less than the maximum cuts. And if we're using one and five and two, three, four, then we won't get the maximum cut. And similarly this way. So here we saw in these three ways, the maximum cuts were three, three, two, but if we try to divide this in this way, we'll get five as the maximum cut. And again, I'll show the number of times it was run. So what we'll do is we'll print the response. I will try to run this again. Here we'll see the number of times, the number of times each. Yeah. So here we see for the first result where one and four are in one set and two, three and five in the, are in the other set where we have the minus five energy. It is run one times like the number of shots, this number of shots, some being 10. This one plus two, three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. This is the number of times we are running. So in one shot, we got this as a result in two shots or two times we are getting this as a result. Highest probability for answer is three, which is this, which is a solution for a problem. So the maximum number of times for the highest probability when we are getting the least problem, this comes out of the solution and this will be the best solution. With the highest probability and when we are sampling out of this, we are sampling here, these, these are the solutions we are getting. And these are two times. So like I told, this is just once, this is coming once, two, three, five, one, four, 
this one is coming out twice this solution is coming out thrice so actually when we are giving just a single solution or for the single solution our computer and either will only give this as a solution because this has the maximum probability three times out of 10 we are getting this so when we are sampling this out of the total number of runs we get this as a solution so let's say if we reduce the number of runs to one maybe we'll get the right answer maybe we'll not get the right answer so let's see here <clears throat> Hmm. So here we see that when we are running it just once, we didn't find the global minimum here. We found the local minimum, which has a value minimum value as minus four, and which is not the right answer. Which is not the answer which we are looking for. So for us to get the right answer, we have to run this more number of times and sample out the results, so that we are getting. the exact or the real correct solution with the maximum probability so here we see again when we are running it 100 number of times this problem we are getting more number solutions and again here we see the solutions with the minimum eigen energy minus 5 minus 5 minus 5 these are coming the maximum number of times 20 times 19 times 25 times so these have the highest probabilities and thus this is the correct answer which we are looking for and the problems these have low probabilities so these are not the solutions so in our run we are getting these with the maximum probabilities and these with the highest number of outputs so let's say if you are running it for 1000 we we'll look for that so yeah we'll get even better answer here because we are running it more number of times so i'll show you here see here the probability increases here these are having more number of probability so we are able to get the right answer but still the probabilities are less compared to what we are desiring for but these are the maximum probabilities and these are the correct solutions so yeah this way the d wave works it runs the quantum annealing process on our objective function which we defined here this objective function and this tries to give us the least energy and also gives us the output or the string of binary variables for which we are getting the least energy so this way for this problem it gave us the right answer similarly we can run this on many other cube problems like i told you these are the many other cube problems you can go and try you can make the cube formulations out of these you can go to d wave you can go to any example you can go to maximum cut example you can change the graph corresponding to the problem you can change the dictionary corresponding to the problem and then you can see if it seems the right answer or not and you have to run it you try to run it more number of times so as to get more probability so this is a way of doing it doing like doing the minimization problem or minimizing our combinatorial optimization problem we have we are having this combinatorial optimization problem which where we have this np hat problem and we are trying to get a minimum solution for this minimum energy for this or the minimum value for this function for a given solution so we desire for the solution here actually we desire more for the solution than for the energy but this d wave is giving us both the qubits or the string of solution and also the minimum answer energy so you can work out this way so we have our software stack the blue cat which is really famous in japan in japan and it's one of the most used it's the most used sdk simulator a quantum simulator which is used in japan so in our blue cat we have a connection to d wave so here we can see so we have the connection to the d wave cloud and we can import our blue cat dot wq as uh, class and we can use this op function 
and then we can define the wave token here or the d wave token here we define the cube but this is we are giving here the matrix so we are giving our cube in the form of matrix we are giving the matrix here then we run this function d wave, d wave function which gives the answer here's the answer and these are different cubo functions for which we can get the answers so you can install bluecat by using pip install bluecat and you can work on these and you can use our functions you can see the tutorials here there are many tutorials for even annealing the simulated annealing we have tutorials for the gate models we will be discussing about bqe variational quantum eigen solver and qao qao will be discussing today but bqe in qaoa from the basic we will we'll be discussing in the next webinar so you can go and check and you can check all the tutorials so even on blue cat site you can go here is a quick tutorial tutorial this is syntax for importing the circuit this is syntax for importing the variation quantum eigen solver class this is for the cube bit here we have the blue cat simulator this is a graphical interface which we have this is in the in the beta version you can go and check it out we have so tutorials for this so these are the tutorials which you can check so these are the universal algorithms teleportation for transform field estimation we have tutorials for all these on blue cat so we have worked upon all these these are the tutorials of the combinatorial optimization problems max cut number partitioning click cover mine internal this bil clicks graph coloring traffic optimization flow optimization we have some tutorials for quantum chemistry also we have for error correction so this is we saw the max cut problem using annealer and we saw how d wave works and how we can use our blue cat sdk to connect to d wave and work on this uh combinatorial optimization problem again with this we can also work using the gate model which is a universal gate model which everyone use which is the most famous one which is being used by google circ which is used by qskate by our blue cat and even regates forest all those are using the universal gate model not the annealing model so in the universal gate model how we try to work on the combinatorial optimization problems is mine algorithm which is the quantum approximate optimization algorithm so this an algorithm for the gate model this again gets its origin from the adiabatic quantum computing which tells us that we start from an initial hamiltonian whose ground state we know and we try to go to the final hamiltonian whose ground state we want to find so in the gate model if we want to work on this max cut problem like we saw in the d wave and the annealing process how we'll go we'll see this fast because we'll just see this in 15 20 minutes we'll do it fast so this being the max cut problem like i told you divide into two sets maximize the number of edges between the two sets so how we are defining the objective function each of this like i showed you here mm here this each of this can be called as a clause like i'm defining here as the sum of the all those clauses maximizing that function will be the answer to this max cut problem so in d wave we saw that we were using cubo formulations or the zero one binary formulation for our variables but now when we trying to get closer to the gate model and we are trying when we are dealing with the poly matrices and the operators and the hermitian operators as we know they have eigen values plus 1 minus 1 for the different combinational bases we have to use a formulation which is closer to the qaoa model 
and the formulation closer to the qm or oa model is the icing formulation like i told you here so this is the initial icing formulation we'll be talking about here this being the coefficients for these sigma and sigma v's and this being the objective classical objective function where sigma is plus or minus 1 then when we are kind trying to convert into an icing hamiltonian which is the quantum objective function we write this as objective function where sigma a is a sigma z a where this is a poly z gate this is a poly z operator this is a poly z operator and these poly z operators have plus 1 and minus 1 as the eigen values so how do we deal with the max minimization problems or the combinatorial optimization problems with the universal gate model and with using gates and all and using a circuit rather than going in the annealing process so we take the help from the adiabatic quantum computing where we saw that we have two kinds of hamiltonians the initial hamiltonian and the final hamiltonian and we try to get to reach to the final hamiltonian and we try to get to the ground state of the final hamiltonian which is the minimum eigen state of the ground energy of this hamiltonian and the state corresponding to the ground energy of the ground state of this objective hamiltonian is the answer which we desire for so for the qaoa we will write our objective function in the form of this we'll start from the qaoa formulation like we saw before and we'll take an example we'll write this qaoa formulation we'll change this qaoa formulation in the icing formulation by using this equation we here reach sigma n sigma a b terms we can reduce the we can remove the uh, the constants which will get later on because those doesn't have any effect on minimization so we'll go here and next we'll have the quantum icing hamiltonian objective function which is this which has the poly z operators and like i told you here uh, this being the complete hamiltonian this being the hamiltonian we starting with the initial hamiltonian and this being the final hamiltonian where this initial hamiltonian being default is the sum of sigma z's this in qaoa we call this hamiltonian as the mixer hamiltonian and why do we need now people ask that why do we need this hamiltonian we can just start with an initial state we can make an operator out of this hamiltonian i'll show you how to make an operator out of this hamiltonian so we can make an operator out of this hamiltonian we can keep evolving our state and then we we'll reach, reach a state we try to get the expectation value of that state uh we'll try to get the expectation value of the operator this operator corresponds to the state we get and if that state is the minimum state or the ground state of this operator we get the minimum energy and we get the minimum expectation value so here we are dealing with expectation value and the similar way in d wave we will we were dealing with the minimum energy for the objective function so here the expectation value of this objective function corresponding to the state which have been evolved if it comes out to be minimum then it is the answer which we are desiring and which we need so why is it an approximate optimization algorithm because here we are not looking for the exact ground state energy or the exact solution if even we are able to get closest to this ground energy or the minimum energy we are good to go because even in polynomial times so let's say the npr problems conventionally are not at all easy to be solved in polynomial time but even using a quantum algorithm we are able to get closest to approximately or even closest to the correct answer which is very very close to the correct answer which is actually close very close to the correct answer in polynomial time that's a big advantage which we are looking for <clears throat> so yeah people ask so we can just make use of this objective function so why do we have this mixer hamiltonian so let's say we start from a function uh, we like we start from a state we evolve the state using an operator corresponding to this hamiltonian when we keep on evolving the state 
maybe and when we are trying to get the expectation value maybe the expectation value is minimum is not the lowest minimum but it's kind of a local minimum and we get into the local minimum or i can show it from this graph on the graph here we are going and let's we are starting from here and we reach the local minimum here and the state now is in the local minimum but this is not the desired solution or the solution we are looking for now when we are applying an operator which is an hermitian operator and we have reached one of the eigen states this being the local minimum this is one of the eigen state and this is one of the eigen energies of this hamiltonian if we reach one of the eigen state which is not the lowest energy and if we keep on working on this we keep on applying this unitary operator on that we'll get trapped into the local minimum we won't be able to get out of this local minimum so like you all must be knowing that if we have an eigen vector that say which is v and we are working an observable which is h on the eigen vector we get lambda v so we get the same eigen vector but with a different uh, what we say the eigen energy eigen value so that is we have increased we have either increased the value of that eigen vector or we have decreased the value of eigen vector but we are not able to get out of the eigen vector so if we keep on applying this hermitian operator on the state which is one of the eigen states we'll get trapped in that into that local minimum we won't be able to get out of the local minimum so this is the hamiltonian which comes there and this is also called as transverse hamiltonian or the mixer hamiltonian because it's it helps us to get out of that local minimum so and this should not commutate with this so if these two are commutables then again this will also lead the state to be trapped in the into the local minimum but as these two are not commutables and these two are orthogonals these two have don't have the same commutation basis that's why we are taking here the sigma x and here we are taking a sigma z if we take it as if we are taking the sigma z then these two will be commutable and then again this will also help to this won't help us to get out of the local minimum so this state actually helps us to get out of this local minimum then again start a process of getting to the goal minimum and then again we keep on evolving th this way and we get the local uh, goal minimum so what is the process of the qaoa we we'll look there here so initially we here we are defining an objective function this is one clause or the objective function corresponding to one edge so here we see let's say if one of the vertex if this is the vertex this is in one set and these are another set we can write one vertex as plus 1 and we can write the other vertex as minus 1 so here this sigma is being having the values plus 1 and minus 1 if these two vertices are different sets then this will be plus 1 into minus 1 this will be minus 1 so this whole thing will be half of 1 plus 1 which is half of 2 which is 1 so if these two vertices belong to different sets then the edge the value of the edge comes out to be 1 and that's what we are looking for and if these two belong to the same set which are if these two are in ones or these two are minus ones and it will be half of 1 minus this becomes complete as 1 so one half of 1 minus 1 which comes out to be 0 so if these two are in the same set then the edge has a value 0 so that's not the edge we are, we are looking for so we have to maximize this function and in order to maximize this function like i told you before we have to do a summation of this over all the edges we have to apply a negative sign because you have to min this qa and every all these of measure algorithms look for minimization we get the answer we take a negative sign for that that's the maximum value and the ground state which we'll get for which this has the minimum expectation value this objective function the sum of this the objective function being this objective function being this which for which this has the minimum value that's the state that state is going to be the answer uh right answer so how we start this process 
like i told you in the idiobatic quantum computing uh, which was here we start in the ground state we start with an initial hamiltonian so here we are starting in the ground state of the mixer hamiltonian or the initial hamiltonian and the ground state of this where is the state yeah the ground state of this this being the mixer of the initial hamiltonian the ground state of this comes out to be this here the ground state here is the uniform superposition of all the states so let's say we have a state we have four qubits or three qubits so what we are trying to do is we are trying to create a uniform superposition of all those so what we are trying to do is we apply hadamard gate on all the qubits and we take a tensor of, of all those so applying a hadamard gate so if you would be knowing applying a hadamard gate on a zero qubit gives us 1 by root 2 of 0 plus 1 which is a uniform superposition of the zero state and the one state and then applying a hadamard again on the second qubit will again give, again give us this 1 by root 2 of 0 plus 1 and when we tensor all those qubits we will get a uniform superposition of the qubits which we are looking for so let's say here we have four qubits of so the four four vertices we will look into four qubits we will apply hadamard on all the four qubits then we will get 1 by root of 2 raised to power n where n is the number of qubits 0000 plus 0001 plus 0010 this way up to 1111 we will get eight states uh, sorry eight 16 states because we are applying a uniform superposition of uh, we have a uniform superposition of 16 states here where the amplitude of each state is 1 by root 2 of n so here we start from this as the initial state as a uniform superposition which is the ground state for the mixer hamiltonian we evolve the state we try to get a so this being our initial hamiltonian so let's see here yeah this being our final hamiltonian this being our initial hamiltonian we can create these unitary operators these two being the unitary operators out of these hamiltonians because actually we work in the gate model or the universal model we work in the form of time evolution operators so we take the states we evolve those using these unitary operators these unitary operators if we want to know how we are able to create these unitary operators out of the initial and the final hamiltonian you go and check out this article by me where you will get to know about i'll put the link of this article you'll get to know how we create these unitary operators and how we evolve over time so here we see if we start by getting a q we start with this we create an initial state as this this being objective function these being the unitary operators and as these unitary operators have sigma z's and sigma x's like i showed you let's go here the final has a sigma z's and the initial one has a sigma x we can write these two unitary operators in the form of rotations so the unitary operator corresponding to the mixer hamiltonian comes out to be this the unitary operator corresponding to the objective hamiltonian corresponds to be this and we do an alternative fashion of these two so what we do is we have an initial state which is a superposition of all the states we apply this unitary operator we apply this unitary operator that is the first process first step so if in the qaoa process the number of steps tells us how efficient our solution is going to be so if we increase the number of steps to two then we apply these two alternatively twice so here you can see from the diagram we have an initial state we have 
we apply hadamard so guys to get a uniform superposition of all the states we apply this is the complete unity operator corresponding to the objective function this is the unity operator corresponding to the mixed mixed hamiltonian or the initial hamiltonian so first we apply this then we apply this if the number of steps are two this is for one step so in qa we have we define steps so if we have defined the number of steps as two then we will apply this this then again we will apply this whole thing and this with different parameters so initially the parameters for the first step are sigma 1 and beta 1 and if the number of steps are two then we will apply sigma 1 beta 1 then sigma 2 and beta 2 <laughs> so that way we will evolve, evolve our state so you yeah, will see the q blue cat first we'll see this is the blue cat solution for the max cat problem so we are here we are importing a circuit class which is the class for the quantum circuit <laughs> we are importing numpy then we are using we are importing the scipy optimization optimize library for the minimization <laughs> then we see that we have the number of vertices s4 and these are the number of edges <clears throat> so these two the unity operators which we are defining are actually the n sets so n sets is another story now so n sets are just kind of unity operators which we use so as we are able to span the whole of the block sphere so you must be knowing about the block sphere so let's say we have a zero state and we have to span the whole of the block sphere what we can do is we can take n sets as rotation about x and we can take take n sets as rotation about y if we apply these two rotation on the zero qubit we can get n sets on the uh, block sphere so this way we are trying to apply these unity operators and these unity operators the uc and the ub which comes out from the objective this is a unity operator corresponding to the objective function this is a unity operator corresponding to the uh, mixer hamiltonian this is the objective hamiltonian this is the mixer hamiltonian so we create a unity operator this way so how we we'll go about this is first we'll define for the mixer hamiltonian for the mixer hamiltonian like we saw this unity operator here is just a rotation about x with an angle 2 beta so here we are seeing this we are doing a rotation this being the class for the state this being a state the blue cat circuit state then we are applying a rotation about x and this being the angle this being the angle this being the parameter this is the qubit on which we are applying we are applying on all the states so this is the second thing we are applying the first thing we are doing is the unity operator corresponding to the objective hamiltonian so the objective hamiltonian for that here the objective hamiltonian has just the coupling terms or the interact interaction terms we don't have any linear terms here so as we don't have any linear terms here we won't be we won't be having this term in our unity operator we will just be having this term in a unity operator because this has all the interacting terms the sigma z j and sigma z k so this is a unity operator which we use and if you have to know how this unity operator how to make the matrix and how to make the matrix for this unity operator and how to evolve around this this hamiltonian where the hamiltonian is a product uh, sigma z products of two poly matrices you can please visit this article this is an important article for you to learn this so and the matrix for this unity operator comes out to be this this is for the single terms the linear terms this is for the quadratic terms so if we have to ha huh, this is the thing which you are looking for so if we have to see look for the unity operator corresponding to the uh binary term quadratic quadratic term in the objective hamiltonian we apply this so first we apply c not 
where this is the first initial qubit and this is the second qubit this is the control this is the target we apply a rotation about z with this angle with as angle has the coefficients coefficients corresponding to the coupling of the quadratic terms in the objective function then again you apply a c not this whole is an rzz gate which is a rotation about zz this is an important gate and this is being used in the trapped and models in most of the in honeywell in all the companies which are using the trapped and models so this is an important gate rzz gate which you should look at through this article it will be more clear so here we see again we first we are preparing the state here like we saw first we are doing a hadamard in all the qubits we have a uniform superposition then we are applying the unity operator corresponding to the objective function the unity operator corresponding to the mixon hamiltonian this way the c not the rotation about z the c not on the edges with this as the first qubit this is the second qubit this and then we are running the state this way we are evolving the state in one step so if we have defined the number of steps as one if the number of steps as one we just do this operation or this evol evolution about these two operators once if the number of steps is one If the number of steps are two, which gives us better result in QAOA, we try to do this twice. So here, what then? What we are dealing with is if i is zero, then we will only be evolving at about the gamma and the beta. It is gamma zero and gamma um, beta zero. If the steps are number of steps are two then we will have i is zero and i is one for i is one we will be evolving it again about gamma one and beta one so there will be two like i told you here in this graph this thing whole thing the first here the this is the unity operator corresponding to the objective hamiltonian then this unity operator corresponding to the mixed hamiltonian one step then again for here gamma 2 gamma 1 we do it again for the beta 1 here so this is been done twice if the number of steps increase and then we return the state and then finally this is an operation this is a function for getting the objective this is objection for getting the expectation value you can go and read this how we are trying to get the expectation value here for the states which we are getting corresponding to the operator objective operator and this is the complete function for our qa where we have initial parameters as empty parameters then we input we append the values here params we have defined here the params being initial params being this so initial parameters we are defining as params and then we are inputting these into these arrays initial parameters we create a state we create a circuit with n which is number of qubits which are four for the graph we try to do a state preparation like we saw here state state preparation is just an inserts preparation we are running these inserts on this and we are getting a new state we start with a state we do you know we do uniform superposition of those so we get a uniform superposition which is the initial state then we do these two unity operators we get a new state then here we see we get a new state we measure the state we try to get here the objective expectation value for that state for expectation value of the operator sigma z operator corresponding to that state if we run it again we try to minimize this using our scipy library scipy optimized library so here we initialize initialize with these parameters we give as a learning rate as this we try to result is going to minimize max cut being the function which you want to minimize init parameters or the initial parameters method is powell we can use any method powell or nelder mead or blgs this being the learning rate so this scipy library the optimized library minimizes this function so that we get the minimum value expectation value for corresponding to this objective hamiltonian 
for the state which we are evolving. So this is a two step process. The expectation, finding out the expectation value is done by the quantum computer and the optimization is done by the classical computer. That's why the QA algorithm is called a hybrid algorithm where we are using both classical and quantum tools. So this way we are trying to, we are minimizing this function, objective function. We are trying to get the expectation value, minimum expectation value. We are minimizing this. So here the output is being generated. Here I'm printing the circuit for thousand shots and we are seeing the output. So the counter here is here the solution for this being is zero one zero one or one zero one zero so that has to be the maximum number of outputs so as this is being run so this is being happening this minimization is being happening the optimization is happening again and again and we see that these are the outputs which we receive these been the counters the value for these the states so like i told you the we have for four qubits we have 16 16 states so here it is being reduced so these are the 16 states which we're looking for so slowly slowly at the end we get the 0101 state with the output 515 times 1010 state with the output 474 times and if you're trying to get the probability, the maximum probabilities are as this Q10101 and 1010. So we get these two as a solution for our max cut problem with high probabilities 5, 0.5 and 0.47. And the objective function after optimization comes out to be 3.995, which is very close to the real value which we are getting. So like we, like I told you, it is an approximate algorithm. So we'll get approximately close to the real solution. And so there we, here we are getting the solution as 3.995, which is very close to the uh, real answer. So yeah, so once what one thing we see here is, here the solution 0101 and 1010, this has very high probabilities. These to be the answers. These are very high probabilities, but what we saw in D wave for this, uh, yeah, uh, like here, the answers here being having these four other answers, these having, these should have, if these four other answers, these should have probabilities as these numbers should be 252, 52, 52, 50. So as we keep on increasing the number of shots or the number of times we run here, this will get closer to the correct answer. So why do we use, why are we trying to go from annealing to QAOA? Why are we trying to go from annealing to solve a combinatorial optimization problem to the gate model? So what we try to see is that when we have a very complex Hamiltonian, and when we are applying annealing process, which is a continuous process. So a difference between the annealing and the gate model QAOA process is that in annealing, the QA process, annealing process is a continuous process, which follows the same steps as the AQC, adiabatic quantum computing. But this QAOA is a digitalized process, digital process. That's an analog, this is a digital, because here, we are not going continuously. We are doing here discreetly by applying these unity operators, UB, UC, and UB again and again, again and again. So here we are going in a discrete way. There we, are, we were going in a continuous smooth fashion. So what we see that if we use annealing, annealing gives us better solution. It gives the accuracy of the solutions is way better than QA. But what we are seeing here is that when the Hamiltonians become really complex and the minimum spectral gap, like I showed you before, between the ground state and the excited energy becomes very, very less. Then the time taken by annealer becomes 
very very much because it increases a lot following this equation like i showed you here so the time taken for the process will increase a lot if the spectral gap becomes very very less so that's why we are trying to use qaoa so as to get faster results for these np hard problems and the combinatorial hard problems so yeah qaoa also has some of its challenges because we have to pre process the matrices which we use which we are using and even in the gate model when we are trying to interact between two qubits which are far apart it's not that efficient because we have to use swap we have to first try to bring the qubits which are far apart close to each other apply an operation and again swap the qubit and like you seen qaoa has good solutions up to few qubits like i'll show you here here we see qaoa is a good less amount of relative error when when it is a number of steps these being the number of steps if the number of steps are three then we have less amount of error relative error and but the thing is when we are trying to go with more number of this quantum volume or more number of qubits the gates and all it increases the number of gates which we are trying to apply and the number of interactions we are which we are trying to do the two qubit gates and the one qubit gate increase a lot and as currently we don't have an efficient way even in a quantum computer and even in a simulator we don't have an efficient way good enough efficient way to do the matrix multiplications and in a quantum computer to work between two far apart of qubits it takes a lot of time and the solution comes the solution is not that efficient so many optimization techniques are being done so one of this is we are trying to apply grovers grovers is local algorithm is an algorithm which uses amplitude amplification so there we are we are using a grover optimizer optimizer for these optimization methods or optimization problems like the combinatorial optimization problems and we are trying to improve the solution for these qao and all those hybrid gate models so for the qaoa yeah so our sdk kit sdk toolkit also has library tools and functions for the qaoa and even for the chemistry calculations through vqe so here you can see you can go to the github of our look at sdk and you can see how we are trying to do a vqe and how we are trying to get the minimum ground ground energy or the minimum eigen energy of a hamiltonian through vqe and how we are trying it even through an annealer and even through qaoa so this is something interesting in our look at sdk so we have actually functions for most of the we have even functions for the annealer we have functions for the sa annealer simulated annealer we have for the qaoa here is a max cut using our look at sdk which you can use we have connections to qskit you can see uh here here we have connection to dwave cloud by using a dwave token here we can work with the dwave machine we can also use qskit as a backend this is how we are using qskit as a backend and we can then run our results on the qskit simulator and yeah and currently i guess it, the solutions comes out to better on the simulators rather than on the ibm qs or or ibm qs or the quantum computers which we have because the quantum computers are too noisy 
we'll see how the Honeywell, Honeywell trapped iron quantum computer works because currently the quantum computers are too noisy and the solutions come really bad. And for you to, for research purposes or for practical purposes, if you want to work on these, then I guess simulators are better bet than working on the quantum computers. So yeah, that's all. I guess the time is over. So yeah, thank you. Any questions? Hi, Gaurav. Yeah. Uh, this is Aditya. Uh, congratulations on a very nice and elaborate presentation. Yeah. I just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, yeah. I'm the CEO of Automatsky, and uh, we are building one of the largest quantum computers in the world. And okay. I've been following Blue Cat for a long, long time, even though Blue Cat is not being used in India. Yeah. So it is great to see you guys launch in India. I'm, I'm looking forward to your further presentations every week. Yeah. No questions Thanks. right now. I mean, it was a good presentation. Just that, um, you know, uh, some things were very difficult to understand, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah. for those, you'll have to check uh, the articles I gave. So if you want to check the time evolution operators, or if you want to check how we are uh, working. So I, I'll i pin down two, three articles, which when you'll read properly and you'll give time, you'll be, they'll be easy to understand. Otherwise, in this time frame, it's not easy to understand all those things. Yeah. I got it. Thanks Gaurav. for the presentation. I as well. Yeah, just one more, one more thing. One more thing. One more thing. Yeah. Uh, Gaurav, you you did not introduce yourself and your team before the webinar. So that oh. is one thing we missed. Yeah, so I mean, who are you guys? What is your background? Where are you are from? What do you do? Yeah, so I am actually I'm from Hyderabad and I'm, I did my BTEC and MS. I did my BTEC in computer science and I did my MS in quantum information from IIIT Hyderabad. And yeah, then after my graduation, I I have been working in the Blue Cat company and then we have been working on this currently. Initially we were working on some Intel software and we were trying to combine our simulator with the Intel simulator. And after those, we have been working currently in quantum machine learning and these NISQ algorithms. So yeah, currently we are just working on those. And we are also working on machine learning, finance, and like you'll see in the coming weeks, we'll have presentations on finance and machine learning, and we'll show how our SDK is connected to PyTorch and TensorFlow, and we'll see all those problems. So currently we are working on this. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Gaurav. It's yeah. Dipanshu. Yeah. I wanted to ask you introduce Grover's algorithm somewhere. Can you please? I, I just didn't get, get you over there. So can you please introduce it? Grover's, it will take uh, some order. No, actually, because... no, I know what Grover's algorithm is, but you introduced in your code somewhere. I didn't get you. So no, you I please... didn't introduce in the code. I just said that in the future, okay. we'll be looking into Grover optimizer for having better solutions to the optimization problems. Currently, we are not using e Currently, we can, uh, I'll pin down an article. QSpit has built a new optimization module where they are using the Grover optimizer to improve the efficiency and get faster results for this optimization problems. So currently, they're in the code. I haven't shown Grover, but I told that in the future, we'll be looking into Grover optimization and all for better solutions. Because currently, QA and all are really slow, even slow really, really slow than the conventional laptops and the computers which we are working. Okay. And like, yeah. uh, just sorry for in for your inconvenience. Hi, Aditya, sir. I'm Dipanshu. We've been talking back and forth on LinkedIn. Yeah. I just love your content. I just wanted to let you know. And you should love Blue Cat also. They are a yeah, yeah. wonderful framework. I've used it for, I think, more than a year or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, I, so I'm already loving it. Within our ecosystem. Yeah. So how did you come to know about Blue Cat? Uh, See, uh, you know, 
whenever I waste my time, I have nothing better to do. I keep searching on the internet okay. and I keep track of things in Europe, Japan, China, etc. Okay. So I found Blue Cat GitHub repository. I think you have three, four repositories. Okay. Blue Cat, Wildcat, etc. Yeah. Blue Cat, Wildcat. Found it long time ago. Yeah. So I've, I've tried all your algorithms, beautifully created framework. I think it's the most elaborate framework I've ever seen. Yeah, I guess it's the easiest syntax, like syntax wise, it's the easiest because QSKIT and Circa, the syntax is not that easy if you want to work, but look at as syntax way, it's really, really easy. And see, the other thing is everything I find from China, Japan, Korea, etc., is in Hangul uh, and, uh, you know, so uh, this time your framework is completely documented in English, which was a pleasure. <laughs> Yeah, okay then. Thanks, Gaurav. Thanks for the yeah. presentation. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I will stay in touch. You know, I, I know you on LinkedIn, so yeah, thanks yeah. for the presentation. Yeah. Oh,